It's Kubrick's Universe, the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Dear Leon, thank you for your great talent, energy, and kindness. Sincerely, Stanley. People who met him for the first time would always come out saying, Oh, geez, nothing like what I've heard about. I know the real Stanley Kubrick. What Leon did was a kind of crucifixion of himself. 30 years he spent with Stanley Kubrick. They were inseparable. I was doing theater, television, prestige, costume dramas, BBC, one-off plays, cop dramas, sitcoms. I shocked you, didn't I? A phone call came through and my agent told me, you've got the role in Stanley Kubrick's picture. Can you imagine? Ah, can you imagine? I almost passed out. Leon was a spirit. The apprentice that all of a sudden one day became the master with all the answers. Daddy, you gotta listen to Stanley. Look scared. Look back, look back. Left Danny, turn right. Look around now. Hesitate. He was my acting coach. Come and play with us, Daddy. It wasn't even in the script that they were twins. I was just looking for someone who was good. And he looked at it and he just said, well, it's no question, is it? Stanley assigned Leon to me. Sir, no, sir! Are you a Peter Pepper? Beat it up, beat it up, fast, fast, fast. If it wasn't for Leon Vitale, I doubt I would have done half the job. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Stanley. Oh yeah, there was just so much to do. Leon was always He was like, pow, pow, pow. Stanley never trusted anybody. He just did. Everything had to be to the millimeter. It is your responsibility to make sure they understand exactly what you want. Inventory. Timing sheet. Trailer. Translation. Lab work. Kind of time. Layout. I don't know how to do layouts. Sure you do. These are from Eyes Wide Shut. I'm playing eight different people. When somebody would say to Stanley, I give my right arm to work for you, he would kind of smile. Because I actually think he thought, well, why are you lowballing me? What, just the right arm? I wanted, I wanted to be with Stanley, work with Stanley, do all that stuff. I just wanted to. So it's a happy ending? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Hey everyone, welcome back to Kubrick's Universe. Okay, coming up, you're gonna hear our first interview with none other than Leon Vitale. We hope Stanley Kubrick fans will really enjoy listening to Leon share his insight, his humor, and his personal side. And we're really honored to be able to bring this special to you now. At the boards is the fantabulously inimitable professional gentleman of Lija himself, Mr. Stephen Rigg, our show's producer. And I'm your host and the night watchman at Outpost KDK1, Jason Furlong. Okay, so we just heard the trailer from Film Worker. It's a poignant and revealing look at Stanley Kubrick's longtime assistant and friend, Leon Vitale. We had the good fortune to speak with Leon at length following the premiere of Film Worker in 2018, and it was a really great conversation that we at the Kubrick's Universe team enjoyed very, very much. Leon was kind enough to spend a good deal of time with us, and in this episode, he's going to speak with us about his recent induction as a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and of course, about the fascinating documentary Film Worker, which shines a light on the tireless dedication and countless other qualities which Leon brought to bear working side by side with Stanley Kubrick for almost 30 years. Now, with all that in mind, it might just as easily have been said that in Kubrick's universe, this man needs no introduction. He's almost as mythic a figure as Stanley Kubrick himself. Actor, craftsman, and invaluable longtime assistant to Stanley Kubrick, Mr. Leon Vitale. Leon, thank you so much Hi. for being here. Hey. Okay. You're welcome. Welcome to the show, my man. Great to have you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, nice to be there. 
Well, I just want our listeners to know that we also have on the call um, the uh, producer of Matthew Modine's Full Metal Jacket Diary app, Adam Rakoff, who is a friend of yours. And uh, mm-hmm. can you tell us tell us how you guys first met? Uh, um, I could, yeah, you, oh. you, you, yeah, well, I mean, I met Adam really through uh, the Full Metal Jacket uh, Diary project. And we actually, the uh, first time I met you, I think we were down in that Vegas, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we were. Um, it was for me. For me, it's Leon. It was a surreal moment because I uh, was there. I was working for Apple Computer at the time, and we were all there for right. what's called NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters. It's a big convention right. for film and video and television production professionals to kind of come and see the latest gadgets and tools and software of the trade right. and uh, I was there and, and you were there and Matthew Modine was there and Vivian Kubrick was there and we all sort of spent <laughs> a couple of days together walking around the strip <laughs> and playing blackjack <laughs> and having having uh, meals together it was it was a lot of fun so that's right I remember Matthew was on quite a winning streak <laughs> he was <laughs> we, yeah at a table, very low yeah. stakes it was like a low stakes table I think we kind of wandered off to the kind of old part of town and he was playing like right. a five dollar <laughs> blackjack game, but he kept winning. <laughs> so, I don't think he won a yeah, lot. It was, yeah, it was fun. That's how that's how you do it. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah. Penny stocks. That's right. Yeah, so we, we've, we've you know been keeping in touch over the years, and of course, Leon was so helpful during the development of uh, of our Full Metal Jacket project. Uh, he was just a wealth of knowledge and information when we were kind of going through old photographs that Matthew had taken, Matthew couldn't remember where they were, where they were shot. And you know, he was, <laughs> Leon, you knew everything. You knew like what road it was on, what town it was in. It was just, wow. uh, you know, you were <laughs> so helpful. Well, I mean, how can you forget? I mean, yeah. <laughs> every, every, loca- every location was like a little battle in itself. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I mean everything. What Vecting Gastworks to the um, Basingbourne Airfield and the en- right, Barracks at right. Enfield, all the yeah. There's just so many uh, sort of locations. Yeah, our our hope is to sort of be able to show the 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 users of this app that you know, where the film was shot. So if they wanted to go visit these sort oh, of great. historic locations, you know, see what they look like today. <laughs> yeah. And I think I oh, think wow. Vecting Gastworks is like a like a condominium now or something. I, I Probably, think yeah. yeah. I'm sure, yeah. Long I think they built, a, they built a freeway through Beckton. Oh, it seems, I think. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Time, time yeah. changes everything. It does, yeah. All in the name yeah. of progress. Progress, <laughs> progress, <laughs> progress. Yes, we need... We won't, re- we won't rest until we can pave every square inch of this earth. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. um, well, I, I have a, 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 an initial question, which uh, is timely and hopefully the right one to start with. But by way of congratulations, Leon, into your uh, on your recent uh, Academy uh, membership invitation. And th- my question is, how did that come about? And I have a follow up. Oh, God. Oh, well, yes. Well. I mean, no one was more shocked than I was when when they sort of let me know that that it happened. Um, I know for a fact, and uh, you know, bless him, and uh, that Matthew had, had been writing to the academy for a couple of years, I think, um, uh, sort of recommending me. I guess that's the word. Um, and then after the uh, um, the movie you know, film work had came out. Um, I believe somebody who I'm not quite sure who it was. Um, I think it might have been somebody named Albert Berger. And he actually uh, sent the sent a, a copy of the film to the Academy, and um, we we actually screened it there too. Um, and so we kind of knew that the Academy actually liked the film, but we only thought it was just for a reference, you know. Um, to show the memberships and um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and then su- suddenly you know on a Monday it was like it was a bit like you know when you hear stories about people 
saying, oh, they woke up on Monday morning uh, with somebody telling them that they've won an Oscar, you know, or been nominated for an Oscar, you know. <laughs> it really wasn't like that. I just, I woke up on on, the, on a Monday morning and I, there was something in my email and I just opened it up and it was a confirmation that I'd been uh, accepted into the Academy. And you could have, as we say in England, you could have knocked me down with a feather. Right. Um, I, was, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I mean, it's just nothing you expect to happen in, in your life, you know. I mean, it's really weird. Um, but it's, it's, it's so exciting, too, because I think it's, um, I don't know the actual ins and outs of, of everything, but it seems mm-hmm. to me like it's a, a place, they've got a new attitude. They, they've got a huge intake of people, I think 900 and something uh, yeah. this year. And it sounds like they're very serious about wanting to sort of get people to interact across every kind of uh, category, for want of a better word. And um, that excites me. It really does, because I think uh, it's something that needs to happen. And uh, I think it will generate a, you know, a, a good buzz and feeling through the whole profession, to be honest. Well, certainly. Well, one of the bylines of the uh, announcement of the Academy's 900-plus uh, new members was about uh, more inclusivity and uh, across right. all demographics, age groups, um, exactly. male, female, uh, et cetera. And so I'm just wondering if it's not asking a personal question, apart from what uh, mm. your inclusion means, obviously mm. uh, we, we want to know what your inclusion means uh, to you personally, but do you have any thoughts about uh, that latter part as well? The fact that they're really opening it up Yes, I mean absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm very, I, I'm so excited um, about the way that the actual nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty of, of uh, film production, you know, mm. seems to be opening out. It's a little bit, you know, the way that uh, you know the sort of <laughs> the whole sort of establishment of the of the music industry um, evolved, right. you know, some years some years ago, and I was always convinced that. That was the way that, uh, you know, the sort of establishment of, you know, the film establishment should, should kind of follow it. Mm. Um, it opens up so many more doors. I mean, there's such wonderful, interesting new, there's, there's this guy uh, whose work I, I'm really interested in, Sean Baker, you know, he made Florida Project and yes. Tangerine and he's not, afraid, he's not afraid at all to, absolutely, he's not afraid to, to try anything and yeah. to, and you know he's he's brave, and I think he's uh, I think he's w- really something to be followed, and 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 hopefully you know that he can expand his world, um, and the way that he's he's so open to, I mean, shooting of I, I think he must have been one of the first to shot a movie on iPhones. I mean, yeah, you know, I think yeah, and, <laughs> and I you think know, that's and, accurate. And the thing is, yes, and I, and I the the thing is that when you look at that film Tangerine. You think, yeah, it, it it fits, it works, it's perfect, you know, mm-hmm. because it's everything in that film is about, you know, how temporary life is and mm-hmm. how you can get hung up on one little thing and you've got to, you, you move on and move on and everyone's sort of rushing around, there's just nothing settled whatsoever. Yeah. And the whole sort of nitty gritty of the underbelly of Los Angeles just, mm-hmm. it was just staring you in the face, you know, it's... I, I was so I was so impressed when I saw the Florida project. I thought was uh, uh, you know a little masterpiece. I mean, you know, it's a great you film. You would never think would you? You would never think you know. It never crosses your mind that there was a movie apparently made for two million bucks because you, it, nothing like that crosses your mind. I know. You know right, you're so right. deeply into that whole that whole situation, and you know. Wonderful, wonderful acting, and I mean, this guy. I think he's got a huge future. I hope so. Anyway, I, so, I would so, hope. So. Meet, yeah, meeting people and and sort of uh, looking at the whole process from that point of view is what I find really exciting. That's happening. There's there are a lot of things happening, and you kind of uh, you know the people are unafraid. Really, I think they've been kind of unleashed somehow rather mm-hmm. like it happened in as i said in the music industry some years ago yes and now with the, as you pointed out with the iphone uh and you know shooting a feature-length film on that especially with the uh 
the subject matter of uh, the transience of life and people coming and going. Yes. As you describe. So, something about shooting on an iPhone with its handheld, you know, it's a, it's a very stable, you can get a great stable shot, but yes. those two things seem to work perfectly together. And I couldn't agree more. Like, yeah, I just, I mean, I think he really pulled it off. And I loved Florida Project as a follow-up. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, I was so impressed. I really I'm, gl was. I'm glad you brought it up, yeah. Well, I, I have to yeah. ask you about your, speaking of project, your project and the big one, which, uh, uh, you know, has thankfully brought you to the attention of so many people who would have never otherwise known of your completely invaluable work. Um, I'm, of course, referring to Film Worker, and I want I want to ask a few questions about it, starting uh, by mentioning, sure. of course, uh, well, our friend Tony uh, Ziera, the director. Right. Uh, he was yep. so great. He was so great uh, to me the, the, the evening that we met at the Metrograph. And, right, um, right. And as, as we understand it, he initially contacted you in connection with uh, his forthcoming Eyes Wide Shut documentary, which is tentatively titled SK-13. And right, during, right. There, there was there was some interview about Eyes Wide Shut wherein it occurred to him and producer uh, Elizabeth Yoff. Now, uh, tell me if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Is it Yoff? Or yeah, Yoff? Well, I, Yoffe, I think. Yoffe. Yoffe. OK, thanks. Yeah. Now, they they felt that you would make a great subject in your own right for a documentary. So uh, if you could just right. tell us anything comes to mind about how that developed how long it took you to get on board uh, about making a documentary of all those years you worked with Stanley Kubrick. Well, I mean, it, it was a bit like waking up on the Monday morning, hearing you've been nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> I kind of, it, it, something that never crossed, it never crossed my mind in a million years. Anyone would want to make a documentary about me. And uh, I think the, I, I was, uh, I know everybody says this, don't they? I was reticent at first, but I was really reticent at first mm. because, first of all, I mean, you know, I never thought of, you know, for me, it was a, a, a beautiful, you know, wonderful place to have been to be working with the person I, I really considered to be the greatest filmmaker of the 20th century. I mean, oh, yes. I just felt that before I met him and, and you know, when I saw, well, like like a lot of people, I mean, 2001 was, you know, it was like a whole out-of-body experience for me. You know, I saw it when I was 20 years old. Yeah. And and here's something for the archives. I've never, I've seen that film hundreds of times simply because I've had to work with it so much over the years, you know. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but I've, I've, I've never seen it out of body or mind. <laughs> I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've been straight. Every time I, I got again. you. I got yeah. I got your meeting. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, 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 there's a bit of me that kind of thinks, well, you know, because so, a lot of people say, well, I saw that film for the first time. I was tripping, and oh, you know, right, right, right. be blown away by. And I kind of thought, well, it, it, it's a bit strange. Really. It's like sort of, you know, going to Disney World and dropping a tab of acid because you want to see how weird <laughs> it is to shake hands with a six foot tall mouse. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> does one does one need the additive? I mean, I don't know. But um, and so, and so you know, and do you um, really need the enhancement, right? Do you need the yeah, enhancement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not where two thousand mm. one's concerned, and maybe no, a exactly. six foot tall mouse if you're, you know, not <laughs> yeah, six yeah, years yeah. old. But that's another story. Yeah. No. no, I think no. So, 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 they, so, so you know, he came to me, and, and <clears throat> you know, at first it was like a. A, a long first interview simply because I thought, well, I thought he did too. And he had this thought, you know, we were, you know, it was about SK-13 and going to be about you know, part of that project. And they came to me uh, after a couple of, you know, the first interview was like uh, about two, three hours, three hours, I think, with a video camera. And they came back to ask me some supplementary sort of questions. And, you know, uh, I, I have to say, when I first met him, I mean, within a, a few, very few minutes, he kind of felt like, you know, well, this is somebody, whatever happens, you know, will be a friend, you know, it, it, yeah. it was that kind of connection. And um, so when it came to me and he actually came with the idea, um, 
yes, I was, I was, I was kind of, whoa, wow. I mean, I couldn't, couldn't have thought of this actually happening. And I thought about it and I, I actually talked with my three children, which is a funny word to use when you think that, you know, the youngest of them is 35, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and, and just uh, how would they feel? Because, you know, you know, there's, of course, a lot of the ins and outs of what I was doing, they wouldn't have known anything about because they were so young sure. at the time. And, sure. you know, they were, they were sort of, what can you say? I mean, there were bumps and very big bumps in their lives, you know, along the way, but they were absolutely for it. And, uh, and I thought, okay. And as, as we sort of started to develop, um, you know, with the interviews, it started to sort of show itself to be something that could be more than about one person, really. I mean, it, it's, it's about the below the line people. It, mm-hmm. That's how it evolved, really. And it sort of stayed on that track and, and got more and more into that, that, um, that vein, you know, where you suddenly realize, oh, well, yeah, here's an army of people that nobody ever talks about. The most documentaries are all about, you know, the star, the producers, the directors, mm-hmm. you know, the mm-hmm. actors. And um, and it just seems suddenly you thought, wow, this is really exciting because there's a way of letting people know, hey, you know, there's a lot of people under the line here and a movie can't can't happen unless all these people are on board. Yeah, and I think in the same flow, you, you, you know? you've, you've touched on something really interesting, if I may, which is that, you know, by uh, highlighting a film worker arguably the most mm. uh, dedicated of all time, you know, it did kind of open up a bit of a dialogue, at least where I could see on the internet and so forth, where people were beginning to talk about film workers. And yes. you were yes. at the vanguard <laughs> of this, you know, but that's a good thing. That's a great thing to have all these people, as you say, below the line, who are really, you know, the nuts and bolts, absolutely essential to getting things done. And Definitely. if there Definitely. if there are more you know uh, if there's more of a spotlight brought to their attention for all the dedication that they've given to every project for their better part of their lives, um, right? I, exactly, I that's, exactly. That's just a beautiful thing. And, and, it, and know, it's a world that stretches beyond you know most people's conscious imagination because it doesn't just stop. Exactly. You know when the film's out. I mean. Adam, I mean, look, you're you're so deeply involved with it, but who would have, who would ever know, sort of, what your world, your part of this world, you know, demands of you, and, and right, right, you know, it, it stretches throughout, you know, the whole different strata of well, society. That sounds like a highfalutin way to put it, but <laughs> it reaches into so many areas of of so many different people's lives. Yeah, I mean, and, um, I, I, I joke all the time, Leon, that I aspire to be the uh, Leon Vitale for Matthew Modine, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, am so, I, I am so flattered. I, am so I want to be as, you know, invaluable to him and all of his projects, both, you know, current and upcoming. And yeah, I mean, but I'm, I'm the same way, though, Leon. I feel like I don't have one title. I do so many different things, whether it's right. graphics work or producing or whether it's marketing yes. and promotions it's like there's just not there's no definition for that and i think you coined the no. term i really i mean I, are you the first person to ever use that term film worker in a sort well, of official you, capacity? i mean in 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 tony's film you know it's sort of if i i'd moved to sweden um to stockholm because i made a film over there as an actor and mm. i was so determined to sort of get into by that time because it was I got that job because of Barry Lyndon, you know, um, right. uh, as an actor. And I, you know, I'd said, uh, you know, how, how I'd become so, so absolutely enamored and, and gobsmacked for a good old English word about watching Stanley work and how he put this stuff together. And it was yeah. so fascinating to me. And so when they offered me this role, it was a, a Frankenstein film, but it was actually the first of 37 Frankenstein films that actually followed the book, <laughs> you know, from oh, beginning cool. to end. And, uh, and I said, I'd do it if as long as I could work in, in you know, some capacity in, in the cutting room afterwards. And I said, 
you know, my biggest mistake, of course, was to say, I'll, I'll do it for nothing. And they said, yeah, you bet. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Fine. right. Sign <laughs> here. <laughs> yes, I Sign and, here. Uh, so I, I moved to Stockholm and I actually met somebody on that production and we uh, we got married. And I was coming back to England. And at the time, you had to fill in these little, well, I think you still do, little uh, uh, immigration forms on the as you're beginning to land. You know, you follow it. And I suddenly realized I couldn't actually, when you said profession, I couldn't think, well, I'm not really an actor anymore. And I've just worked on a, you know, sort of in a cutting room and I've done some odd jobs and worked in wardrobe and stuff like that. So I just wrote film work out because How that's the only way I could think of myself. And it, it sort of grew from there, really. I mean, wow. I've always thought of myself as that ever since. And and now it's so nice because I heard about some people in the industry when they first saw, you know, the early sort of uh, screenings of the film. They were actually saying, right, okay, yes, film workers, that's what we're going to call ourselves. And um, I Brilliant. thought, well, how gratifying. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, we can trace the etymology of that word right back to uh, you landing, uh, uh, your, your flight landing on your way back. Yes. <laughs> that's just so cool. Yeah. I mean. And uh, I, I can if you, write, if you feel if you're doing an email, if you're writing an email or a text, and you write the word film worker, it always comes up not known. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The autocorrect on my phone is always trying to tell me it's not a word, and I'm like, screw you! It is a and word. We're, yeah. we're going to have to now. Now that you're it is now. Entering, <laughs> now that you're getting you're entering the academy, our next uh, campaign has to be to get that term officially added to the Oxford English Dictionary. So yes. that it's, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's Ray, we're gonna, and we'll have to give you credit, of course, for that. Of course. <laughs> we, have to, we have to start extending those tentacles of uh, influence, Adam. <laughs> and, uh, Stephen, yeah, let's see what we can yeah. do to make that happen. And it's yeah. funny that Adam said that uh, he aspires to be, to Matthew, what uh, you were to Stanley, Leon, because, see, that's how I aspire to be to Adam. Actually, right. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. No, actually, oh, I aspire to be that to Stephen Rigg, who is the producer of our show, and General <laughs> Bon Vivant. Yeah, I was going to say that's that's a sensible choice. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> if he'll have me, of course. If he'll have of me, of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Steve, Stephen Stephen Rigg is the Stanley Kubrick of podcasts. So yes, that is something to <laughs> aspire to. <laughs> He is. He's rather enigmatic. He's enigmatic. He he hides yeah. behind you know the, the scenes and just gets everything done by hook. By hook, by hook. Uh, another couple of things I've got in common uh, with Stanley is I've got a beard and three daughters. Oh, well, there, you go. there you go. And I don't like driving over thirty miles an hour. That's that's, <laughs> yeah. true, that's true right, as well. Right. <laughs> in my case, in a Porsche. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So, well, I, all right, okay, I, um, I, I'm going to come back to all this hilarity, which uh, I'm sure will uh, sow itself into our convo, but I do want to just ask about, uh, since we're on Film Worker, like, you, you mentioned that you and Tony kind of hit it off in, in so many words, I'm paraphrasing, you felt right. like you, you could trust him. Did that, yes, al- yes. did that allow you to feel like you could open up on camera? Because... You really are t- being asked to talk about a lot of very personal things, not just of your relationship with Stanley, but your personal life and right. your family life. Well, that that was something that, you know, you, you couldn't imagine, you know, when we sort of started the whole thing. And of course, the first couple of interviews were more or less devoted to, you know, the subject of Stanley. But it's, I, I actually found it in the beginning quite difficult uh, to open up. And I realized that, of course, I hadn't really thought about it in, in, in that way. You never do. I mean, you know, it, it sort of creeps in there. Suddenly you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, that's a bit of a personal question. <laughs> you know? And, and uh, you know, Tony and Niz were very, very patient with me. I mean, uh, we really sort of, they came to L.A. and we kind of you know, hammered it. And um, and what they, what they did, I mean, Tony sort of says that, it started to open out when we went up to the attic and I p- pulled out this big box and just tipped it over and there were hundreds of notebooks wow. that I'd had 
during that whole period and uh, that I kept. And uh, so I started going through them and sort of reading bits and it suddenly kind of thought, oh yeah, uh, I remember doing that. And I remember at the time, you know, um, I was going through, you know, a, a rather painful separation and and stuff like that and started to sort of just evolve in, in that way. And of course, the more we got into it, the more I got used to it. Um, but these things, when all said and done, anybody's personal path throughout a process, even if it's entirely bureaucratic, you know, doesn't stand in isolation to the rest of their lives and what's going on yeah. in it, you know? So it began to, it began to evolve in that way. And of course, when, when, when they started interviewing other people and I had no idea, you know, I mean, what they would be saying about me. And I'd also, I'd also made a, an absolute commitment to them that, um, I wasn't going to try and say, well, I don't want that in the movie or I'm, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't want that in there or I don't want that being said or what have you. I just said, whatever comes, let it come. And, and they embraced that. So it was a real kind of, a, um, you know, what do you call it? Symbiosis mm, going on. Yeah. You know, which Perfect just grew and grew and grew, you know, and, 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 you know, and thankfully <laughs> most people were extremely generous, and, you know, and, but also, you know, in that way, it opened up doors to other people who, you know, came onto the scene and, and so it was ever it's sort of morphing. Uh, it never stayed the same, like, uh, you know, that's the target Z <laughs> and mm-hmm. stick to a path. It was much looser and freer than that. And I think that's what kind of shows in, 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 in Tony and Liz's film, you know, is, the, you know, how it meanders, you know, through totally different areas of, of people's lives and their experience. That's very well said. I mean, I think it uh, is also, if I may, uh, you know, it's it speaks volumes to your character as a person, as a man, that you would just be willing to be open and be forthcoming, as you said, not, uh, you know, ask to have things held back. Because I think for a lot of us who, you know, have been drawn to Stanley most of our lives and wanting to uh, know what we could about him as a person that that level of authenticity and uh, artistic integrity and honesty um, yes. that 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 we find you know where we where we're able to uh, in doing a reading and so forth and what you just said about your willingness uh, when you agreed to uh, uh, you know be the subject of this fascinating documentary that it's it's uh, mm. It, it says that you two were kind of uh, perfect together, like, you know, or you were you're peas in a pod, as we say, uh, in terms of right. having that, that same frankness and the honesty. And that's in today's world, you know, especially with social media where people can pretend to be somebody else, that's something that's uh, sorely needed more than ever, I think, that level of honesty. That's what struck me when I saw the documentary the first time. When I saw Film Worker, I, I was right. floored by your, your candid uh, approach. And that now the the documentary, you know, it it, it also it I, I I noticed a minute ago you mentioned uh, finding the boxes in the in the attic, and uh, there's great right. footage of you in your attic with those boxes in Film Worker and. Tony and uh, and Elizabeth also made very clever use of a lot of archival footage uh, from you and your acting career. They utilized yes, clips yes. from a lot of the British shows that you were on, like Fen Street Gang, uh, Crown Court. Yeah, I, I, and- I, didn't, I didn't think any of that existed anymore because in the early days of uh, you know television sitcom and, and et cetera, you know, when they discovered that they could shoot with video instead of, of you know, film or, right, you know, right. other, other kind of, you know. Um, you know, the BBC, for instance, they they made these wonderful series like uh, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. But, of course, what they did was reuse those tapes after <laughs> they'd gone out on air. You know, and you kind right, of thought, right. oh, that's so English. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, what, what an approach. So I was so shocked at how much footage they actually found 
I hadn't seen a lot of it in my life ever. So, so you did not you, you did not have the chance to revisit any of those performances prior to the documentary being put together? No, 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 no. It was, it was kind of remarkable. It was like sort of opening up your own time capsule. <laughs> you know? Right, but you, but, you, well, but you had the foresight to trust them, I guess, uh, uh, Tony and oh, Liz, yeah. to, to just go with it. Yes, yes Brilliant. absolutely, absolutely. Because absolutely. Wow. I tell you, one thing that always kind of, well, it shocked me actually. It was there were some people who, of course, they they either for whatever reason and it doesn't, didn't matter to me, you know, didn't want to partake in it. And there were some people who said they would, but they wanted a list of questions beforehand, mm-hmm. and then they wanted to pick which answers, uh, you know, right. uh, were used. And then they actually some of them demanded, you know, a couple of them demanded they wanted to have. Uh, overview into where exactly in the documentary these uh, sections were going to go. And he kind of thought, well, this actually defeats the purpose yes, of the whole right. idea somewhat, you know? <laughs> right, right. Then, then, then you're back into, you know, those documentaries that are made about the making of this or the making of that. Right. Well, really, I mean, there's there's nothing else to say except how brilliant everybody was. You know, and how wonderful everybody was. And you kind of think, well, you don't really learn very much from it. Yeah. You know, from them. They're just interesting, you know, baubles in a way. I don't want to get disrespectfully. Yeah. No, no, I understand because, uh, what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, so, it, it, you know, that in itself was something that I had not thought about particularly, you know. Um, before, you know, we were doing, working on this. So, well, I suspect that's what you know, about to be open and, and, and candid. Mm, mm, yeah, not, have, yeah. not, not having, a, a, you know, a, a, a notion to put any kind of a construct or to put up walls between you and the subject matter or Tony and Liz for wanting to uh, hear your story. No, right. No, and, and, you know, in a way, it kind of reminded me a little bit of, you know, when I was at drama school, the fact that it was, we worked so much with improvisation and, and what have you, and you, of course, of you course. worked on situations inside, and you, you saw things grow in a different way than you could have ever imagined that they yeah. would, you know? And for me, that, that was, you know, a really, really, you know, beautiful thing to see something change and morph and all these nuances come in. Which you don't usually get, you know, in a, some kind of formulated situation. Yeah, you're not going to get that when everybody else wants to have their the final uh, draft on. Uh, well, these are the questions I'll answer, and the, you know, and this is where I yeah. want it placed. And that that kind of uh, uh, obtuse approach, you know, can only make things difficult. But you know, where it's not necessary to be that difficult, you know, a path of least resistance is often the, the best path. But this brings me mm-hmm. to a question about, you know, difficult things, uh, so to speak. And, and if it's not too personal, I want to ask why you think it is that uh, Stanley would ask you, trust you, to do some of the most difficult things. I have a follow-up, but uh, what's your take on that? Yeah. Please. Well, well I, I, my, my take on it was that there wasn't, I, I don't, you know, it, it sounds very romantic, but it, it wasn't at the time. Um, he w- he wasn't afraid to sort of say, you know, whatever job it was, uh, you you should try this. And, I, and very often they'd say, well, I, you know, take layouts for instance, you know, yeah. doing the layouts, for, you know, video sleeves and, and point of sale material and you know stuff like that. And um, and I said, well, I don't know if I can do that. And he said, sure, you can. <laughs> sure you can just Amazing. try and it kind of it, it, it just about everything developed in that way and it wasn't even, sometimes it wasn't even conscious because one thing does naturally lead to another and it makes you realize that nothing there's nothing that is inside a project that is isolated in itself you know right. i mean right. 
people tend to break categories, you know, they sort of, the acting in the movie, uh, the props in the movie, the costume design, the, mm-hmm. you know, DOP and, and what have you. But in actual fact, they're all intimately related, or they are if the movie has to have some meaning, you know. Uh, the, the, nothing is there in isolation. That's the whole point. you gathering all this material, all these different areas of uh, you know, what goes in to make a picture and Stanley was always convinced that there was no such thing as a simple picture, <laughs> you know, right. everything, right. even a simple close up was not a simple close up, you know? And, and so you, you really got, began to understand that how everything tied into everything and you couldn't just think of it as, you know, in isolation, you know, as the job itself, that it had a relevance to everything and everything had a relevance to it. And and so it was a true involvement. And I think the longer we went on, like, you know, when it comes to uh, color timing, for instance, you know, mm-hmm. I actually say, you know, for 25 years, I was put through the Stanley Kubrick School of Color Timing because from the very <laughs> beginning, I was sitting there next to him with the timing sheets, you know, and we'd sit there and we'd, we'd spend maybe two, two more, sometimes more than two days, just every frame was sacred. Every frame was sacred. And yeah, yeah. to get a color balance, a density and the contrast that, you know, he, he wanted and he felt his films needed. It was, um, you know, you've got to herd a lot of cats, just like we had to <laughs> in Vegas, Adam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of it's cats a great together. To, yeah. Yeah. To, to get, to get them in all pointing in the same direction and not everybody's <laughs> subject for view is the same as, 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 as Stanley's, you know? So yeah. you had to kind of, you coax it there, you coax it there. And, um, and so, you know, for 25 years, uh, you know, I've been working with all of his movies with him initially. And then he started to let me go, you know, and go down to the lab on my own and bring back, you know, what it was that I, you know, the work that we've been doing down there, uh, which was always the most terrifying part of any job was bringing it back to Stanley to see, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, like being in a you know, <laughs> Roman circus and waiting for the thumbs up and the thumbs down, you know, <laughs> right, and, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, I mean, and, and, the, and the thing is it becomes a part of your process too. So you don't actually think you, you, however long hours you're working or however long something takes to achieve, you know, uh, yes. you know, you can do it and 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 do it. And at some point it kind of works or, you know, you come to a point where you say, <laughs> this isn't going to work and you finally <laughs> abandon it. You know? And you say, oh, we need to think about this in a different way. You know, it's, that it's was a-, a wonderful thing for me because nothing was, nothing was ever settled ever. Ever, right. until you know until you know, you kind of you could feel it you, you know you could feel it you could work for as long as you you know had to on, on you know, days and sometimes and when there's, i worked with yeah. actors you know, there's an expression you know, you kind of, the artist knows when to stop painting yeah, yeah yes 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 <laughs> no absolutely absolutely there, there, there's a lot of that or it comes to understanding that you know there's nothing left to paint. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Right. One more brush stroke, yeah. ruin it. But until we reach you that, screw it up. There's, yeah. yeah there's, uh, right. But if if you haven't reached that uh, point, then you p- keep going. You pursue uh, what you know is going to be there as long as you follow through. If that makes sense. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And then it becomes the whole chain of you know what makes up a. 90 right. minute or a 110 minute movie, you know? Right. There's um, also a, yeah, uh, a, a, I was saying there's a funny, uh, I was going to say there's a funny uh, correlation, I think between the way Kubrick seemed to work and the, what they call the, the Parkinson's law, which is that work will expand to fit the time allotted. Although I'm sure <laughs> Kubrick expanded that a time allotted many times, but, no, yeah, well, well, it, it was, he did think about it in a different way. He always thought yeah. that the time will be allotted <laughs> to <laughs> right, whatever time. it was he needed right. to expand. Yes. Right. <laughs> Unless there was like a, a hard deadline, right? Like for Full Metal Jacket, there was a release date, I, if I recall, that he had to make that that June 
17th or I forget what it was um, date. So you, you guys were scrambling yeah. really to, um, to finish oh, yeah. post production. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, oh, it, yeah. it seems but that it, he. You know something? It, 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 even if it had been, let's say, they'd say, oh, instead of June 17th, we'll, we'll give you till October. And right. uh, <laughs> October would have come and we'd have still been scrambling. You know? Well, and, and that's that's what I mean by yeah. That's what I think that Parkinson's law dictates is that no matter how much time you're given, somehow the work expands to fill the that amount of time. It's just sort of human right. nature that you will use that time. Like he would never have said, "Oh, I have till October, but I'm I'm done in in August. Great, now I can take a, a vacation." Right? He would just yeah, use yeah, yeah, in yeah. it of that extra time he was <laughs> to keep tinkering. Yeah, vac vac vacation was an unknown word. In, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to we're gonna get to, we're gonna get to that <laughs> yeah. later. But I mean, that well, that Adam, that's a great point because that's something that I uh, think about often. I've, and I've used that expre this expression from time to time. Of course, I did not make it up, but it's, you know, there's only two ways to go about doing any one thing, the easy way or the right way. Yeah, right. Well, that's that, right. you'd have, yeah. if you'd said that in front of Stanley, you'd you'd have put your name up on the wall. <laughs> <Tell you. laughs> oh, that's not the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me, Leon. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. I am officially you're blushing. <laughs> so there was one other thing. Uh, the one other thing that you said a moment ago, Leon, that I I find really interesting. You mentioned that in early, you know, in the in the early days of working together. You would say, "Oh, I don't, I don't know how to do that," and he would go, you, "Of course you can. You, you can do that." And what if he had said, "Oh, you don't? Okay, um, let me find something else for you to do." I mean, that would be—he would be a very poor mentor and teacher, right? He right. knew, though, he right. knew, he saw the potential in you. He knew that you could do it, even though you didn't know you could, and you did do it. You, you found a way, and you learned everything, and turned out to be a, probably one of the best people that could do it you know so it's um it's just that says something about stanley uh, is that he 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 pushed you but in a way you wouldn't have had this this amazing career if he hadn't right i mean you knew what no 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 ab yeah. ab ab absolutely absolutely i mean I, <laughs> you couldn't have put it better and <laughs> uh, and and but when i think back about it now you know it's a bit like yeah, you know, there used to be a program on English television, which I actually think originated in America, called "This Is Your Life." And I always thought, mm -hmm. oh, you know, they, they get somebody up and some celebrity, and and they needn't be a celebrity; it could be people who worked in letters or sciences or what have you. And then they'd sort of drag up all the sort of family and, and human beings and contacts that had ever been a part of their life. And I always used to think. God, I wonder what the breeze going like now for everyone that sort of came on. <laughs> and you know, it, it, it's it's astonishing, really. It was such a it's a, it was such a great idea, actually, as a program. You know, that you realize the things that happen in life, which if you if you're fortunate enough to be in a kind of let's say a freewheeling, let's say profession, as uh, in filmmaking you know, or theater or art or whatever it is, you know, creative uh, side, when I use creative kind of loosely, um, you know, how much of your own life just becomes so relevant to what it is you're doing, you know, in a in that capacity. You know, you draw on experiences that you might have forgotten about consciously and suddenly you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, that, that means something to me. And, and, you know, of course, I've had, I've done lots of different things in my life before I met Stanley. So, yeah, why mm -hmm. wouldn't, why wouldn't I give it a try? Why wouldn't I, you know, and, and he sort of go from there. But, it, you know, Stanley was a master of sort of knowing sometimes what buttons to push, <laughs> you know, um, Surely, to get yeah. you going, get you moving. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, he he. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Stanley was invited on to uh, This Is Your Life when the show celebrated Arthur C. Clarke, but but Stanley <laughs> he, he declined the offer officially <laughs> and then privately apologized to Arthur C. Clarke, which is a cool, yes. cool story in itself. I, I I had not. Do you know, Stanley? I'd never heard about that. 
but it makes me, it, I, I mean, I, it just makes me laugh. I mean, <laughs> it really does. You know, there was, a, there was another program that they had in, in, in the UK, which was they would take a celebrity and there'd be a psychologist or, or a you know, psychiatrist talking to them, asking about key points of their lives, not necessarily about their professions. And then they'd cut to somebody who they'd, uh, who had known this p- person and said, well, you know, ask them what were your impressions when you first met him or, or during the time you spent with him. Mm-hmm. And that was really revealing because, you know, we, we had a, a, a fantastically creative person in, you know, called Spike Milligan. He was part of a, a, a you know, yeah, a gang of a, called the goons, you know, and it was yep, a precursor absolutely. to, to Monty Python. And and he was also kind of known to be uh, an oddity. That's how, you know, eccentric. That's how people used to explain people who weren't quite normal. <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> and, the, the, and they cut away, you know, every time he, he talks about an experience, they cut away to somebody who'd been there in the time that he was talking about that experience. And he'd come back and he'd say, I don't know. I mean, I don't recognize that person at all. I mean, meaning himself. And it was yeah. <laughs> it was such a kind of or, or gently brutal thing, but it was so interesting because you know. And can you imagine having you know a half hour program? You know, this is your life, and Stanley was. I mean, you you'd, <laughs> <laughs> you'd get as get as far as when he was five years old before it was time to shut the book. You know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ast- astonishing. Yeah. Hmm. Have you uh, had a chance to read uh, uh, Michael Benson's new book? Because that's where uh, we learned about the Arthur C. Clarke uh, on This Is Your Life story. It's mentioned. No, I haven't. It's, no, it's no, a I haven't. phenomenal read. I'm sure you you know can easily uh, proclaim, I don't need to read it. I lived it. But, uh, you know, I would no, recommend right. it. Uh, it's just, it's a, it's a very... Uh, fascinating read. it's dense but it just flows it's expertly written and oh, um it's, it's, it's What's just it called? yeah it's called space odyssey oh 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 do you know something somebody gave me that uh, uh what a beautiful thing to do um on a screening we had here in in uh santa monica you know when uh, about i don't know about two months ago and nice. it's actually in a pile of stuff uh, which is you know one of those things I'm going to get around to that when I've got, you know, the time to actually not just dip into it, but to actually start reading it and stay with it, you know. When when, <laughs> when you're not being asked for interviews for, ad infinitum. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, no, hey, that's, it, that's a nice it, problem to have, as they say, and I, I only hope we uh, yeah. uh, respect your time, man. Oh, um, yeah, great. So, well, now back to the, 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 the documentary itself, you know, when... Uh, mm. Uh, Tony, uh, the director of Film Worker, he brought uh, Film Worker over to the UK to show it to uh, Stanley's wife, uh, Christiana, right. and uh, right. Stanley's brother-in-law, of course, you know, and uh, yes, longtime yes. producer Jan Harlan. Apparently, they loved it. Were, were you aware of that happening? And uh, if uh, so, were you nervous? Not in, not in, no, no, uh, nervous, no, because, you know, um, there was nothing to my knowledge that was of uh, any kind of artificial construction about it, you know. Right, right. Um, and simply the way that the film had evolved, as I say, you know, it was uh, almost an homage, it was, to, you know, below the line uh, workers in the film industry. I kind of, you know, for me, I kind of felt, well, no, there was nothing to worry about. Um, but of course, it's also reassuring um, that they enjoyed it and they took it for what it was. And uh, so, I don't think they were, you know, demanding or anything about sure, changes. Sure. I mean, there was some things that they might have kind of um, denied about, but there was no real kind of kickback or or, or obstruction in any way right, there whatsoever. Right. Which you know, was very generous of them. I mean, talk about. Talk about being tired of, of, you know, of relating your own life to one other person's. I mean, they've been having to do that all their lives. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's generosity in itself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well said. So, here, 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 here. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, one so. of the things is that you know that struck me 
So I, I'm a big lover of documentaries. I know Stephen is Adam, uh, our friend right. uh, James Marinaccio, who's uh, you know one of the uh, essential uh, admins in the uh, Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society, and he's also been uh, an incredible video archivist, uh, going back to the days when you had to. Uh, look in the TV guide and set up your VCR to uh, record a 30 second news clip about Stanley, you know, because you heard it would be on Channel X or what have you. Right. I, I love yeah. I love a good documentary. And the thing when I sat there watching Film Worker and the best word I can still come up with is how it struck me then and there as I sat there watching it is organic. The way it flows. Oh, right. And, and that's the, the it's a, it sounds a little uh, obtuse and uh, by way of definition but it's the highest compliment i can personally pay because i love dr yeah i love thank you i, I, thank you. I mean because i think that's something that you know one can take and and, and treasure uh, you know that it, it was org organic it felt organic and that's a tribute of course to tony and, and this and and the and way you. that they handled all that material you know i mean they must have had uh, god knows uh, how many I mean, we spent almost three years, you yeah. know, filming and, you know, um, you know, God, I mean, it's a jigsaw. I mean, the, I, it, it convinced me more than ever because this was Stanley's philosophy anyway, which was it's what you leave out that actually makes what you leave in yes. relevant and yes. meaningful, you know. And it's a huge, huge jigsaw puzzle when you get down to that editing process. For anybody, well, you, I'm sure, you, you, know. you, yeah, you were well. Just to touch on what you brought up briefly before about the music industry having changed. The same thing with music. I'm a lifelong musician, and I remember a quote of you know, it's not the notes you play, it's the notes you don't yes. play. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It can sound trite, can't it? Kind of coming out of the the wrong mouth, <laughs> but if you, people, <laughs> but no, but it's true. You know, if you if you're somebody who's been actually working you know all your life in that kind of uh world in that area it means everything yeah. it means everything you know and and with stanley you know um that's why the script you had in your hand when you started shooting i mean you knew most of it would you know not make yeah. it to yeah. to the end product and uh, not and not make it but you know, would have actually been relegated to, you know, this is totally irrelevant now, the way that the thing has developed and morphed, you know. It's morphing. And, yeah, um, it's yeah, 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 yeah. And and that's another thing which I think is fantastic is how open, you know, a filmmaker or an artist or anybody, you know, creative has to leave themselves to leaving things behind. Bergman used to say, kill your darlings. You right. know, in other words... Right. You might have a, a a line of dialogue that you treasure, and you think this this means everything, but yep. there may come a time when you realize that it stood in the way of so much that you could have it. explored. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know? No, th that makes total sense. I, I get mm. exactly mm. what you're describing with that. Yeah, kill your darlings, um, and and it also uh, uh, speaks a little bit. Well, maybe more than a little bit to. Uh, Stanley's approach to editing where, you know, he knew that Absolutely. what you have to work with is uh, what's going to determine the, the finished product and, and what you might end Absolutely. up having to leave out uh, could exactly. have been something that you, you, you thought uh, invaluable at the, at the starting point. Um, yeah. Well, I just, yeah. I, um, I just want to uh, mention that uh, I, uh, we are bringing in uh, James Marinaccio into the call. James is uh, the guy I was just talking about. And uh, right, right. he's a huge fan of yours and a uh, good friend of all of us. So uh, I'm wondering if you're there, James. I'm here. Can you hear me? Hey, man. Yeah, I can hear you. I'm, I, I've got to say, when, when you, you say that, you know, the huge fan of mine, it gives me a bit of a weird feeling because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm usually a fan of <laughs> everybody, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and to, to hear that is, is a bit kind of... You know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Some, it's somewhere out in the east, or you know. <laughs> no, it's cool. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, you you handled that uh, overt compliment with grace and ease. <laughs> as I, mm. as nice I to, knew you nice would. to have to meet you. Nice, Sorry. Nice to have to meet you. 
<laughs> nice oh, to have no, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. J- James <laughs> is one of the funniest people I've ever met. I'm just going to begin his uh, introduction by uh, throwing that out there. Just so uh, oh, everyone. What a pressure! Thinking. What a pressure you just yes. put on him. <laughs> Pressure's <laughs> on. Yeah. I'm just here to listen. Maybe just, I'll just I'll just turn, mute my mic and I'll just listen. I just got home from work and I, I want to eavesdrop. Maybe something will pop into my head, but just go with <laughs> more, guys. Cool, brother. Um, <laughs> nice. So, all right, Leon. We um, this is great. We got everybody. The gang's all here. Um, oh, great. Yeah, uh, you went to con back in may of 2017 with tony and liz to screen yes. uh, film worker uh do you have any particular memories that uh, stick in your mind about that experience um boy boy i mean i'm sure of course i have of course i have i mean there was so much actually um about Khan that shocked me in that it was exactly as, you know, it's been portrayed on film when you see, you know, the Khan film festival this year, blah, 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 blah. But, but at the same time, you realize that, you know, behind it all, it, it's, um, there's people in panic mode probably 24 hours a day. Right. Um, you know, it, 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 it's such a sort of, and, and there's no denying, there's no denying that mm-hmm. it's, a, it's beautiful to stand there and it was such perfect weather. And they said to us that we were very, very, that they were very, very fortunate because, you know, the year we were there, which is last year, you know, 2017, you know, mm-hmm. um, it was the first time and it hadn't rained throughout the whole thing. Oh, you know, wow. Very often it's just pouring with rain. And it was, it was, it was kind of heavenly. It was almost like you had died and gone somewhere and you kind of thought, um, oh, I think I could live here, which of course you can't because Khan's only <laughs> like that for about you know four weeks. <laughs> right, you know? right, right. And uh, you know, but um, but it was also it was also you know so comical because you could stand on the, the main thoroughfare and suddenly you know there'd be a, a, a Porsche, a, a Lamborghini, a Bentley. Mm-hmm. And, you know, every, every, everything was a convertible, and everything was kind of you know, young, rich uh, dudes yeah. who were just driving up and down that <laughs> stretch of road, you know, ac- you know, was across from the, you know, the beach and the ocean and what have you. And they were just there to be seen and to display right. themselves. It was, right. it was almost like you kind of wait, you know, when, when I was an actor and we sort of studied, you know, kind of the reformation in England, you realize that the whole area of London, like, you know, uh, Covent Garden, was just there for people to go out and show off their finery and walk up and down the street and be seen. And it was yeah. so much, so redolent <laughs> of that kind of, you know, vanity, which is somehow stupid, but kind of touching in the, in the same way, you know, that you work oh, so hard to sort of, you know, and, and it was, yeah, you, you, it, yeah, every age is, you know, I'm absolutely convinced there's nothing we go through today that hasn't been gone through for right. almost every every generation, it's yep. just the dip, the scale is different, and the way that it's shown is different. But the feeling is 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 still the same. And that's a great that whole point. Sort of, yeah, that whole Khan experience for me was, I'm glad I I'm glad I did it because it's so easy to sort of sit back and say, yeah, well, you know, it's this and it's that, and you you can be so tempted to do that, and for yeah, good reason yeah. sometimes. But you look at the dedication of the people who organize that that event, I mean, and what it takes to organize that event, you think heavens above. I mean, it's, that's a, a year-long job in itself, you know? Yeah, there, you may have a it new term a, there, uh, festival worker. Yeah, festival have... <laughs> worker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a good one. Yeah. You should coin that, too. You can take the yeah, credit for that. Yeah. Now, and I find it funny that you point out that, like, here are all the nouveau riche in their Lamborghinis, you know, and their mm-hmm. their redolence uh, needing to be seen. And uh, you had to wear a tuxedo at this screening, if I'm not mistaken. I did. Tell us about that. You're not mistaken. You're no, not a tuxedo well, guy, was, are you? I'm not really a tuxedo guy at all. It becomes a, kind of a, 
a weird out of body experience in a way. Right. <laughs> you know, you you put the thing on and you and you look at yourself in the mirror and you think, This is not me <laughs> at <laughs> all. <laughs> but, but but then you do, if you think about it, you know, the way I thought about it was, well, you know, something you used to, you know, when you did when you were an actor you played different roles and you put different clothes on and you, you know, it sort of did something to you to be in a, you know, mm-hmm. dressed in a way that, and of course, you know, a thing like a, a DJ, you know, um, it kind of makes you stand in a different way for a star. Sure. You know? Sure. Sure. And, sure. and you, and, and you realize it gives you a whole different kind of, uh, I don't know, not persona. That's, that's crazy. Um, but you know, if you if you could look at yourself, uh, you know, down on yourself from heaven, you kind of think, oh yeah, well, it, it, it's almost a whole different person. Yeah, who's that guy? Here, you know? Right. Yeah, who's that guy? He's <laughs> a doppelganger. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. They say yes, every. Thank God, I don't have to be in three hundred and sixty-five days a year. Right, right. <laughs> your 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 twin. They say everyone has a twin somewhere in the world, and you're the guy yes. hanging out. You know, like cool pair of relaxed jeans and your doppelganger yes. is forced to wear a tuxedo every day, but he doesn't get to go to con. No, <laughs> that's a, true. <laughs> you were a secret agent in con. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good one, yeah. Adam. <laughs> so did, yeah, you, yeah. did you have to wear the tux? I won't stay on this long, but did, or did someone request no, no, it? You, yeah, no, no, you did. You, you really, really ah, did. Okay. I mean, very, very, very strict. I mean, you know, if you were showing a film, if it was a film and you were involved in it, you had to wear a tux. You had to wear a tux. And in a way, you know, I kind of think, okay, well, you know, it's probably, and I know, you know, the Oscars, you have to sort of wear a version or an idea of what a tux might look like. Um, but uh, in a way, it's like I, w- I was watching a bit of Wimbledon, you know, the other day, and Wimbledon's yeah. kind of unique because they, there's an all white rule, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, can, you, you, can, you you watch other sort of big tournaments and they they look like, you know, they've been down to, uh, I don't know, <laughs> some <laughs> sports shop, which is now trendy and, and yeah. you know, <laughs> the, Nike, the Nike shop and, and, you know, they turn up in just about what they like. But there's a kind of, I, I don't know, I don't want, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm, a, you know, I was brought up you know, in school, we wore school uniforms, you know, right, I mean, right. we just did, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, and there's, there's something which is a, is a kind of a leveler, you know, it kind of equalizes. doesn't matter how big the, yeah, 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 a bit of an equalizer, the way that every Marine had to have a buzz cut, you know, because, right. you know, absolutely, it, it's sort of, it's a way of, you know, taking the ego a little bit under control and um, making them realize that you're part of, of a bigger thing than you are. You know, I guess that's the psychology behind it, you know? So, so and for a guy who, uh, a guy, it is interesting. And I have to ask for a guy who maybe has never worn a tuxedo other than maybe one other time in your life, going back to the days where you had to wear a school uniform, where does right. Leon, where does Leon Vitale get uh, a tuxedo on the fly for Khan? On the flight. Oh, I can tell you where I got it. Um, I, I, I got it because uh, Tom, with Tom Cruise, you know, in Eyes Wide Shut, the first scene that you see him in is a tuxedo. And he had, of course, two, you know, you know one and a backup, you know. <laughs> and so so, so you... When, when the shooting, when the shooting finished, I, I said to Stanley, can I have that? <laughs> can I have one of those? <laughs> and, he, and he said, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> and so, you know, it's only the second time in my life I'd ever worn it. <laughs> oh, my but, goodness. Um, but it, it fitted perfectly. It fitted perfectly. It was just perfect. So I was meant to have it. That's how I thought about it. So now, so now we know exactly how big Tom Cruise is because he's your size. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, as yeah. I mentioned on the show before, Cruise is from my hometown of Glen Ridge, New Jersey. And um, right. he, he graduated about seven years before... I did from high school. So I, I, and I'm told that he dated, uh, my next door neighbor. They had like five daughters and no sons and they were all gorgeous, uh, girls. And one of them used to babysit for us. But, uh, I I do recall 
you know, when he was just up and coming in uh, uh, Hollywood and people were saying, oh, you know, he's 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 not as 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 big and strapping as they make him look in these action movies. And uh, right. well, Le- Leon, you've met me. I'm only about five, five foot six, uh, you know, and uh, and and people were saying, oh, no, yeah, he's he's about your height or something like that. And I was right. I was, I was thinking, well, you know, maybe he could, you know, leave a tux behind for me. But that never happened. <laughs> so, uh, so now, now we know. Um, now we know why Red Cloak wanted him to remove his clothes so he can have them. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> how very, how very droll. Yes, very, yes. Now, get undressed. Get undressed. Remove your clothes. Gentlemen, please. Oh my God, my, yes, it's it's my, my soup, my super objective in that scene, of course. Yes. (laughs) Get the damn top. I think uh, I think you should have worn I think you should have worn the red cloak to the premiere. That would have been a <laughs> little more. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! That would be, yeah. uh, that would be all see, over the news. The Entertainment Tonight helicopter yeah. being like, oh, the mystery guest. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, well, what do we know about yeah. this uh, mystery guest? Uh, stay tuned. Yeah. We're going to have a special after this special about the mystery. Yeah. Oh my god! Well, talk about talk about weird thing. I mean. Uh, in in that for that role, I actually had to wear these six inch high uh, heels. I mean, not heels, but the whole sole. It you know, just like himself. platform soles in the seventies. Yeah. Yep. And they were six inches high, and you know, and of course, I had this long drape about me. But believe me, I mean, after six weeks in in that costume, I'd learned how to actually run around in it because in between takes, I had to go and find other takes for days that we'd shot <laughs> other, uh, other parts of the sea for continuity. So, you know, I became really agile on those damn things. I mean, I it's quite amazing. So. You had to <laughs> run up and down some stairs if, uh, to like do other aspects That's right. of the job. Like while, yeah. And now it's, please get in front of the camera. We have to focus. That's, that's <laughs> just what. Yeah. <laughs> How do you put that on a CV? <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah, so, um, and a few days ago, one of our members, uh, a gentleman named Ali Oz Edwards, posed the following question to the group, and we thought it might be appropriate to pass this question over to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ali wrote, I'm watching Film Worker for the first time on Amazon and suddenly sat up in my chair because. The first shot shows Leon Vitali walking through my hometown of Stratford upon Avon, which is also Shakespeare's <laughs> hometown. On, right, the, yeah. on the right is the Dirty Duck, a pub many actors in the Royal Shakespeare Company frequent when not on Absolutely. stage. Yeah, and yeah. he concludes, I know Leon is a classically trained Shakespearean actor, but can anyone shed any more light on this background? And his possible link to the town I am proud to call home. Well, yeah, and I would say that um, Stratford on Avon, uh, which was 16 miles away from where I was raised in Leamington Spa, it was always a kind of because of my English lit teacher, you know, at a school. We were always taken from when I was 13. They. You know, she organized these uh, school parties to go and watch, uh, you know, uh, one of those productions at the RSC at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Mm. And when I, you know, it's so it's, it's always been a, it had always been, um, I, don't, I don't want to sound like, you know, the Sentinel <laughs> kicked off 2001, but it was always a kind of a right. bit of a beacon to me, you know, as when I was really interested and, and sort of understood that it was possible to be an actor, I always sort of wanted um, to be, a, you know, a, a member of the RSC, the Royal Shakespeare Company, right. you know? Yeah. And, um, and you know, in the summer, 
you know it's uh, such a wonderful thing to do is to go you know to Stratford and, and, and watch a play and then you you know you've got the river Avon you know mm-hmm. and there's, there's this built over you know against it so you're just looking down and you've got these terraces and god knows what mm. it's beautiful sort of experience and then you go off you used to go off to the dirty duck for a drink afterwards you know and um it was something that i sort of did when i used to go back home from drama school and, and what have you and um so and it's it's just you know one of those things that you feel the atmosphere of a place, you know, and it is, it's, it's all, mm. you know, of course they, they make the most of it. Of course they do. You know. <laughs> Shakespeare's birthplace, you know, right. Shakespeare's first house, first place where Shakespeare ever took a dump. You know, kind of <laughs> and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and anyway, so, um, but, but you see, after Barry Lyndon, it was amazing because, um, uh, I got, I did get a, an offer to go and join the Royal Shakespeare Company. And, uh, you know, if I'd been in any other frame of mind, you can bet I'd probably still be there now. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lovely town. And, uh, you know, you, you know the, the person who communicated with you just should say, he's, he's, you know, I'm glad he lives there and I'm glad he's proud to be there because it's, you know, you should take the trip one day and, and, you know, in the middle of June, you know, sort of near the midsummer eve, you know, yes, where yes. the light is long lasting and you probably still got daylight around about nine or nine thirty, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. in the evening and it's beautiful and, and pouring with rain. <laughs> I, hey, I but, love um, summer rain. It's in fact, it's happening yeah. outside my window right now. It sounds like your hometown was really an idyllic place to grow up. Stratford, it was, I, but it was, it was. It, it's funny, right in the Midlands, and it's it's a beautiful area because it's it's a mixture. It's it's kind of small industry, um, um, sort of ten miles away. There's Coventry, which you know sort of deals in a lot of small industry, and then a little further away, you've got all the the big sort of well, you had huge car manufacturers and stuff like that. But in mm. the sort of area of where I was. It was mostly rural, you know, and beautiful rolling hills, you know, mm-hmm. countryside, mm-hmm. as far as you could see. And um, and it, it really was. I mean, I still, it's one of those cozy feelings that I have when I think about, mm-hmm. you know, gr- growing up in my childhood. It's not like that now, because at rolling countryside is now sort of rolling blocks of apartments mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, um, but uh, you know, it, it was a... It was it was kind of idyllic, but ironically, um, because of all the small industry, you know, when I when I was born and uh, around that time, uh, it was just after the war, and of course there was a lot of immigration because you know they needed to make up the numbers for everyone lost during the war. So, uh, Leamington Spa, Royal Leamington Spa, mm. it became a flashpoint for a lot of. Uh, race riots and, and stuff like that. Oh, wow. That was going on for a long time. Yeah, yeah. It sort of lasted for quite a while. And, um, but, you know, right up until when I left um, uh, to go to London, uh, it, it really, it was, it was a, a pretty kind of good place, you know, good schools and, and kind of uh, how everyone imagines that the past was, and it probably wasn't, but you know what I mean. Yes, I do. <laughs> you know? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, everything was nostalgic, you know, and everything was fine, and you know. Yeah, yeah. People, people yeah, now but, from my. Oh, go on. Sorry. No, no. I was just going to say it's, it's one of those things where you you do remember the the good the good sort of days and uh, you know the beautiful days that and you know where I lived there was a river passing right through, um, you know the, the property and the the bank that was all overgrown and what have you so. You know, for me, it was a big adventure playground. You know, it's fantastic from when I was a child. You know, well, I wanted to so, ask uh, you about that. Like, do you have any recollections that you could? What did you do when you were a kid, Leon? Did you play mm. soccer? I mean, you, adventure games. Oh well, well, well. You know, cowboys, yeah, I, Indians. I, I, <laughs> I had to say, yeah, I have to say that you know, I had a quite an unusual kind of upbringing. Um, 
you know, I've got uh, two older brothers and a younger sister. And um, my dad was a, he used to be a, a band leader in, in the 30s. Right. And, right. you know, touring the world, kind of, um, you know, um, Hot Club de France kind of music, you know, mm-hmm. jazz mm-hmm. and what have you. But when he, he, you know, after when war broke out, all the Belgians who were abroad were uh, sent to London or had to go to London to, to muster. And then they became, you know, like security, you know, details and stuff like that. And my dad met my mum, and, and uh, you know, so he, he never left Leamington and he ended up as a, ended up, he became a, he was a teacher, you know, he taught, um, languages because you could mm-hmm. speak you know i think you know seven or eight languages wow which is quite amazing mm-hmm. and um and and uh you know like physical training and and stuff you know and so we were also caretakers of the school where he was teaching how interesting and uh yeah and you know i mean we were always 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 uh broke you know we mm-hmm. always were yeah but the, you know it, it's that usual thing that you know, we were very happy, you know, with each other and we still have that kind of bond today. You know, I don't see my family for, you know, it can be years of the stretch, you know, but as soon as you walk in, you're talking right. as if you just, you know, picked up from yesterday. You know? Right. Is that kind right. Of but there was so much, you know, it was a, so many, you know, so much open, open ground and what have you, that it was just, a place where you ran and there were woods and God knows what. And so, you know, it was sort of playtime, you know, a lot of it, it was just wonderful. And in the long summer vacations, you know, I mean, it was all hours, that whole, (laughs) it was just fantastic, you know? So, um, but yeah, um, you know, so, but I, I was, I was, oh, it sounds really immodest, but I was very good at sports, you know? Uh, So I was, um, you know, I used to, uh, soccer and, and rugby and cricket and tennis. Those were mm-hmm, my mm-hmm. games. And even we had a, a you know, a Canadian uh, PE master and we started playing basketball. I mean, this is, you're talking about late 50s, early 60s. And, you know, it was, um, it's just so much fun. And I was, you know, I was uh, going to have a trial for a, a club called Aston Villa when mm-hmm. I was 16. But the funny thing was, although I would have loved to have done it, I'd already got this bug about, you know, maybe, maybe acting and, Mm -hmm, you know, maybe mm -hmm. doing that kind of thing. So I never, I never did it. But, um, no, I was, um, it was, you know, it had its moments because, you know, every, every life does. (laughs) Um, and some of them were real crises and things like that. But my mum, dragged three of us up you know my eldest brother had gone to military academy in sandhurst Mm -hmm. and he became a career soldier um but you know we sort of uh what can i say it just brought a closeness with us that Mm. never goes away it never has gone away you know so um did you have access to a lot of uh films growing up Uh, like when when did you first realize you got that acting bug like what, what how old were you Oh, well, um, that was something that happened because a wonderful, beautiful English lit teacher um, used to do school plays, you know, one in the summer and one in uh, around Christmas. And from the age of about 12, I was always trying to get, <laughs> so, right. yeah, yeah, I always wanted yeah. to actually be, be in them, you know. And um, so that bug happened. But the thing was... Uh, when my dad was alive, um, BBC TV was just the, it was the only TV station, you know, it started right, at right. five, five o'clock in the evening and it finished at half past 11. That was it. But they used to show a lot of, uh, a lot of movies just as, you know, time filler, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and so he used to watch all these movies and he'd seen some of them, you know, when he was in London you know, during the war. And so he was, Oh, you got to see it. We got, we've all got to see this movie. We've all got to see this movie. So he used to sit down and, 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 and that's why I first saw it's a wonderful life, which remains, you know, the one that's kind of uh-huh. closest to my heart, you know, yeah. Um, yep. Yep. it's such a beautiful story. And, uh, you know, um, 
and so we but he also took the first movie he took me to and you know my brothers um was dunkirk and i was six years old oh, <laughs> was wow like, and, so, and then on the way home you know you're saying yeah uh, saying, well, what was your favorite part of the movie? And, and there's a line, I don't know why it stuck in my mind. I said, well, the, the, when they're on the beach and they're going to be, you know, they're going to try and escape. And uh, you hear this young kid saying, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Mm. And then you hear this guy saying, well, you'll bloody well have to. And I felt that this incredible slap on the back of my head. <laughs> because <laughs> saying the word. Saying the word bloody was the equivalent of saying the word fuck now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it really yeah. was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, so I, I guess, you know, that was another stamp that makes you remember right. <laughs> that I love film, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and, oh, uh, I just... I just love it. I mean, I'm a, and I'm a literature freak. I mean, and a history freak, and it all goes together, really. You know, right? It does. It's all. It's all just a variation on storytelling. That's how I feel about you know yeah, all the. You're art. right. Whether it's song or you know play, you know, theatrical play or cinematic art, literature. Yes. Exactly. People, people exactly. are just sharing their stories with the world, which is why yeah, I've never, right. I've never, I've never liked the uh the the competitive shows they have with uh for like singers now and such because i just feel that there's plenty of room for that in the world if you want to be competitive you have sports and any other number of endeavors but you know mm. music and singing it's just like hey if you like the way i sing if you like this song that i wrote great you know i'm grateful but if not you, you know i don't need to come in last place no, that, yeah, no, I know. I understand exactly what you're saying. I, I really do. But it's it's like, I suppose, really, there's a problem. One of my guilty secrets is I, you know, if I come across America's Got Talent, I'll watch it. <laughs> and yeah, really, I mean, and sometimes you look at the talent that is there. I mean, these 13, 14 year olds that sound like Aretha Franklin, you know? Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, it's stunning. It really is. And these people who have these uh, dance troops, you know, and the, you know, and, and the, the amazing you know, synchronicity that goes on. So like you're thinking it's just one person moving, you know, right. I mean, and, uh, but that, and part of that of course is because it's, it is competitive and it's always been, you know, you know, the myths about Broadway and all that, that kind of stuff, you know, yeah. it, it, lives, hey, Steven, it lives on. You know. Steven's childhood uh, friend, Mickey Kerr, uh, recently hmm. made it into the final round on uh, Britain's Got Talent. Oh, really? What yeah. is, he, is he sing, singer uh, or what? Comedian, comedian, and and yeah. a musician. Oh wow! Like, it's all, just wanted to give him a shout yeah. out because uh, yeah, yeah, we were yeah, all yeah. a little bummed when he didn't win the big prize, but he made it almost all the way. Yeah, big shout oh, out to, to and, and Mickey. That's a hard thing to do, you know, to go up there as, as a comic and you know, kind of stone cold. Oh, is there anything? To, think you're funny you know <laughs> is, there, is there anything harder than comedy i i feel it's i've said this no, for a long time there is Hard, hardest mm -hmm. job in the world because you you can be so, yeah. yeah i mean you could be a bad a plumber and be a bad plumber yeah. and somebody's gonna yeah. hire you to fix their sink tomorrow but if you, <laughs> if you if you if you call yourself a comedian and then you go mm -hmm. on stage and you don't make anyone laugh are you a comedian no well you, you know it's, it's, hardest it's, job it's in the that, world. it's only that it's only if only that guy who's being a plumber sort of thought about it seriously, I mean, he could make a big joke out of being a bad plumber. <laughs> but you know what? The, great, the late, great George Carlin, exactly, Leon. Uh, George Carlin mm -hmm. had a joke about uh, somewhere out there in America is the nation's worst doctor. It's just process <laughs> of elimination, folks. He says yes. it's just process <laughs> of elimination. And that's, that's scary enough in itself. But what's scarier... Yes is that tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., somebody's got an appointment with this guy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He Which was is funny joke. unless you're that guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's the hairline difference between comedy and tragedy, as they say. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> One of life's conundrums, you see. I mean, it's what we live with all the time. We yeah. Really think about it. Mm. Yeah, it's all yeah. it's all peaks and valleys, isn't it? I think for me that's one one of the secrets to trying to figure out how to have a happy life is mm. to accept the ebb and flow of it, and that even when you have a shitty day, you still had another day. 
Yes, yeah. yes, of course, yeah. of course. I mean, you know, I've been born and raised a Catholic for the first few years of my life. You're kind of encouraged to think if you have a shitty day, it's all your fault anyway. So, yeah, right, you know, right. You just <laughs> repent and everything will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Leon, I've just got a quick fo- mm-hmm. a quick follow-up about the... Um, the um, the Stratford upon Avon uh, shot at, yeah. the, at the beginning of film work. Yeah. So I mean, I, I assume that most of the interviews that Tony and Elizabeth did with you were in LA, uh, your, your place. What? So what? Why did you come over? Yeah, to, most of them. You came over to Stratford upon well, Avon, we, and did Tony come with you? I presume so. He, he must have filmed. That. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Tony and I uh, made the trip to England. We also made a, a trip to Stockholm, where we did some interviews, and you. Know, the two interviews with uh, with Max and Vera, you know, my children, um, and um, it was amazing because you know I actually went. You know, it's a funny thing that uh, however however much you you kind of uh, understand how you know life is, and and you think you kind of you know feel it and and, and sort of get it all the way through. When I went back there, I, I was. I was so shocked at, you know, some of the changes that had been made, which, you know, obviously, you know, and um, but in a way, uh, the whole area had still kind of kept its character somewhat, you know. Mm. And so um, we just, we went, you know, to the places, we went to the school that we used to be a caretaker of, and of course, it's it's not there now. It's a giant fucking car park, you know. <laughs> yeah, but and, the caretaker uh, is probably still there. <laughs> they they're buried underground. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, he's underneath. He's underneath the prime parking spot. He, right. He's, a, he's always been yeah. the caretaker. He's he's still he's there. He's always been the caretaker. Yes. Well, that, you know, swinging his swinging his spade. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, swinging his spade. Exactly. Yeah. There there was uh um your dad worked uh for the uh, uh the uh, France uh, uh hot club to jazz. I have to ask, did your dad ever cross paths with Django Reinhardt? You know, I, it, sadly, it's something that I don't know. I And, and you know, uh, being the, the kind of person he was, he was pretty kind of mercurial, we can mm-hmm. say that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, I just heard a little bit about my dad. You know, my, my mum was already married when they met and had my oldest brother already, you know. Right. And... Uh, um, and so, and you know, they actually never married, which you could imagine back in the forties oh, yeah. in England. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jesus, mm-hmm. you know, it was a yeah. Next step was hell, you know. Um, and yeah. uh, so, there's there's very little I actually know about him, you know, for sure. I just know some of the highlights and his his and lowlights of his mm-hmm. life, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and understand exactly, really, why he was how he was, you know. Yeah, a bit schizophrenic, you know. But you know, he, you know, the band, the band that he had, you know, they went to Shanghai, they went to you know the Far East, they, and they were actually in Chicago when war was declared. Oh wow! And uh, so he traveled a lot, you know, during that time. Sure. And uh, yeah, yeah, but and then I would say the only thing about a place like Leamington Spa. Great for kids, which is probably why he he never left it, you know. Um, but not good if you sort of got the any kind of uh, what can I say, entertainment ambition for want of a better phrase, you know. There's nothing going on there, you know. It's just you know light industry and and and, and farms, and that's right. basically what it was, you know. Right. So yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. Mm. It's, uh, you know, I'm going to say it again. It's just too cool of you to share everything you're sharing with us. Couldn't be more grateful. Well, it and all makes a difference. You know, it all makes a difference. It, it's, you know, I was, I, I've always thought there you know, that there's not, nothing that's ever happened in my life, really, where I haven't, when you look back, you, you can you can say, well, I know why this happened. And I also know where it took me or or where it started to take me and, and you know, changed the life, you know, however incrementally it changes it in some way, you know, and enough of those incidents add up to, you know, a big change. <laughs> yeah, sooner yeah. or later, in one way or another, you know. So uh, everything, I'm, I've, I've never discounted anything that happened to me because I've always thought, well, you know, 
this could have been a part of of the process and whether it was a you know a good thing or a bad thing and you know it's it's all part and parcel of it okay well that's our first installment in a series of interviews that we had with leon vitali coming soon we're going to hear him talk about his experiences on barry linden the shining full metal jacket eyes wide shut and of course his long career working closely with stanley kubrick thanks to our producer editor and chief researcher stephen rigg and also to our friend adam rakoff producer of matthew modine's full metal jacket diary app for ipad and our good buddy james marinaccio from the stanley kubrick appreciation society on facebook who joined us during this conversation also Thanks to SCAS member Ali Oz Edwards for contributing a question for Leon. And guys, do check out SCAS, a.k.a. the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society on Facebook. It's the largest online community of Kubrick fans and scholars in the world. And please, take a moment to give a rating and a review of our podcast if you can, as it really is vital to our being able to keep the show going. Definitely check out the wonderful and moving documentary on Leon entitled Film Worker, directed by Tony Ziera and produced by Tony Ziera and Elizabeth Yaffe. Film Worker is now on DVD and is still currently streaming on Netflix in the U.S. Okay, thanks for tuning in, everybody. This is Jason Furlong shining off. We'll see you back here soon on Kubrick's Universe. It's Kubrick's Universe. We just live in it. We have taken very thorough precautions in this podcast against broadcasting anything which might only be attributed to human error. <laughs>